<laughs> so I'm really honored to be here, and I want to especially thank Carrie Balcom for inviting me and for Leah for taking such good care of me. And we have been very impressed. My sister Monica here is joining me. We've been really impressed with the conference and the quality of everything. So I'm really happy to be here. So. To give you a little bit of background, I'm a happy person. I was born very happy. And um, I believe you should follow your heart, you should follow your passion. My favorite phrase is dream big, then dream bigger. And this is how our children were raised. So whenever they had something they wanted to do, I would say, okay, now dream big. Think about what could be even better. And then they say, oh, well, this and this. And I said, now dream bigger because I'm always trying to push them. So that was sort of my philosophy, always has been my philosophy in life. And I grew up in a family of five wonderful girls, no boys, my parents tried and tried, but just ended up with five girls. <laughs> and um, we're all very, very close. And we grew up on a beautiful farm in southwestern New York. We had about 150 acres. We were surrounded by animals right from a very young age. So we had everything from rabbits to pigs, chickens, cows, um, horses, dogs, cats, ev everything that you could imagine that would make an idyllic childhood. And it really was a magical upbringing. And I told myself, I'm going to raise my children that way. I want my children to be able to experience this. So I promptly went out and had three beautiful children. Then I went and met the love of my life. So I don't do anything in the normal order. <laughs> and we got married and we moved over to England. And we had three incredible years over in England working at the University of Nottingham School of Agriculture. So my husband, Larry, he was um, studying Chinese Maishan pigs. These are very prolific pigs. And he's a reproductive physiologist, that's what his PhD is in, and he wanted to find out why are they so prolific. And I was working with Professor Eric Lamming, and Prof helped set public policy for man cow disease. So he advised the British and EU governments on, because the mad, this was in the early 90s, and so the mad cow crisis was very big. So our jobs were coming to an end, and my sister Mary sent us the, the book, What Colors Your Parachute? So that we could figure out, you know, what did we want to do with our lives? So we knew that we wanted to work together. We wanted to do something in agriculture, something that would involve our children, and, but we weren't quite sure what. And one day, Larry came home from the Sutton Bonington Library, all excited, and he has a copy of the British Sheep Dairy Newsletter. This is 1993, and he says, I know what we're gonna do, we're gonna milk sheep. And I said, we're gonna milk what? Because at that point, I didn't realize you could milk sheep. <laughs> and um, we started doing the research, and we found out that in 1992, the United States had imported over 50 million pounds of sheep's milk cheese, and less than 0.001% was actually produced here because our ancestors brought over meat and wool breeds but they didn't bring over dairy breeds. So we contacted USDA. We said, how do we go about doing this? And we had to go, travel through Europe, go to all these different countries, try to figure out who had the best dairy sheep. Excuse me. So this was in France, and then we went to Spain, and this was in the Pyrenees. And then we ended up narrowing it down to Belgium and the Netherlands and New Zealand. And so along with the dairy sheep, the East Frisian, we also brought over the Beltex, which is a um, meat breed. They look like little pigs, um, but they have incredible meat. And then we brought over a couple of Charlet rams. And so it was a three-year process of working very closely with the USDA to import the animals, to get all the regulations passed, to have the permission to bring them in. 
And then we flew them on planes from Europe, and then I went over to New Zealand and flew back with the sheep from New Zealand. And when the sheep had to go through two months quarantine in the country of origin, and then a month quarantined here in the United States. And we had such an incredible working relationship with the USDA that I asked Larry to take this photo because I said, I hear all these people that are whispering about, you know, oh, the USDA being so horrible. And I said, I just want to show that we had a really good relationship with them. So this is us with our son, this is me with our son, Francis. So, to back up, when we started, we sat down with our three children, and we said, okay, these are the jobs that are gonna be involved in the farm, what appeals to you? So nine-year-old Francis, he wanted to be pasture manager. He wanted to be in charge of the rotational grazing, because we did rotational grazing on our farm. He wanted to be in charge of sheep health. He also wanted to have a dog for herding. So we went out, got him a beautiful collie puppy, looked just like Lassie, came from a herding family. Both of his parents herded cattle. Well, these sheep were not like cattle. Cattle would run from his parents. These sheep ran at him. He was deathly afraid. <laughs> he stayed in the corner of the paddock any time we tried to take him in with the sheep. And this is one of his hiding places. <laughs> Our middle daughter, Heather, she was seven, and she wanted to have a llama for guarding. So this is her sister with Freddie, her guardian llama. And then she was really fascinated with the whole milking aspect. And so given her genetics, I figured that she was not going to be much taller than me, and I'm still an inch taller. We built a portable milking parlor for her. And so it was just the right height, and then twice a day from May to October, she would milk the sheep. Then Jackie was a six-year-old, and Jackie's like, well, I'm gonna be the cheese maker. And we said, well, no, Daddy's gonna be the cheese maker. And she said, no, I'm gonna be the cheese maker. And Jackie has always been passionate about food. Her three favorite foods were cheese, beef, and chocolate. And so Jackie started making cheese when she was nine. By the time she was 11, she was making the cheese on her own. By the time she was 12, her cheese was featured on Martha Stewart television. And this is Jackie at 15 in gourmet for being America's youngest professional cheesemaker. So. <laughs> So this is what they deserved. We named our farm in honor of them. So our farm is called Three Shepherds of the Mad River Valley. So we did really well. We imported sheep for ourselves and for other people. And we traveled around. We taught all different people about the pros of rotational grazing, which of course in Vermont, it's very, very hilly, very suited for sheep. And because of the uniqueness of our business, we got incredible publicity. And so um, we were milking the sheep, and then we were also making cheese with the milk, and teaching. we started teaching cheese-making classes at our farm in Vermont. Next door to our farm, there was a country store that we started, and so we would sell our cheese and other Vermont cheeses. So, we were doing it all, a little bit too much, but we were doing it all, and we were having fun. And I was really happy because I was able to give the children the childhood that I had wanted. I wanted them to have what we had growing up. So everything was going really well, and we were to get our final health certificate showing that the sheep were free of scrapie. Scrapies in the same category of diseases as BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease. All of our sheep passed. There was no problem. And instead, we had Linda Detweiler, senior staff veterinarian from the USDA, show up at our farm. And she said, I'm concerned because your sheep came from Europe that they could be susceptible to mad cow disease. 
and we want you to give them up. And we said, well, there's nothing wrong with our sheep. And she said, well, we're going to have to put you under a quarantine then. And we don't want you to sell any of the animals until we find out whether there's actually, because she kept saying that there was information coming out of Europe she couldn't divulge. What she didn't realize was that this was my background. This is what I knew. So as soon as USDA showed up, I contact all my contacts in Europe to find out, is there anything going on with sheep over in Europe? Are there concerns that maybe it jumps species or maybe Scrapey is masking this BSE or anything like that? And there was nothing going on. But they still went ahead and they put us under quarantine. I, of course, was still very optimistic at this point. And um, so this is supposed to be my husband standing in the field <laughs> with the sheep. And so we decided what we needed to do was go over Linda Detweiler's head and go as high up, we were hoping to meet with Secretary Glickman, but to go up higher in USDA because surely they would see with the science that there was no reason to be going after our sheep. And so we flew over three European experts. You can see I'm still very happy in this photo. <laughs> and still thinking, okay, you know, this whole thing's gonna go away. And the three European experts presented all the information, all the history of the flocks that we imported from, everything showing that there was no reason to be concerned. And then we opened it up for questions. And we had USDA, we had Senator Leahy's office, we had Senator Sanders, we had the nat representatives from National Institute of Health, quite a room full of people. And it was silent. And finally, Linda Detweiler's boss speaks up and he said, look, we're under political pressure and you're gonna have to give up your sheep. So at that point I cried and um, I said, could you at least let the sheep go back to Belgium? You know, don't kill them, just send them home. And so they said, okay, give us a week and we'll get back to you. As we were leaving the meeting, Dr. Gibbs from the National Institute of Health pulled me aside and he said, look, I wouldn't hesitate to eat a leg of your lamb but you have to understand that if the United States was perceived to have BSE, it would cause the stock market to crash and your sheep have to go. So being good, stubborn Vermont farmers, we just dug our feet in and we waited for this letter which was supposed to appear in a week, continued with the farming, continued with the cheese making and at this point, it, the whole story got out into the media, and that was one of the best things to happen because then we could talk about it. When we were first put under quarantine, excuse me, USDA told us that they wanted us to stay quiet. And they say, let's keep this all amicable, but let's keep this quiet because if it gets out into the media, it will cause too much of a ruckus. Well, somebody from ABC's 2020 filed a FOIA and our information was included in, because they were trying to, the reporter was trying to find out what was happening with mad cow disease in this country. And of course, most of the efforts to fight mad cow disease were focused on two flocks of sheep in Vermont. And so that got it out into the media, which was a really good thing. And we got incredible community support. And once it gets into the media, it blew up, it was everywhere. So I apologize for the fuzziness of this, but John Stewart loved the story. <laughs> and the very first report he did, he said, USDA is going after sheep in Vermont for fear of mad cow disease. And he's like, um, so he did a tutorial and he said for USDA and he had to cut out, this is a sheep, this is a cow, this is a sheep. <laughs> and um, so we were waiting and waiting and actually months went by and finally we got a letter from Secretary Glickman 
and he said sending the sheep back to comp to sending the sheep back to Belgium would undermine confidence in the integrity of the American animal health system. So they would not let us send them back. So I actually have a quote here, because as Vermonters, we pride ourselves in being independent, um, stubborn, caring people, but realize it can start snowing in October and still be snowing in May. So, um, it's a challenging geographical thing. But back in 1777, General Burgoyne was a British general trying to make headway into the United States through Canada to, and thought that if they claimed New England that we would lose the Revolutionary War. And he came across the people, at that time Vermont was not a state, it was called the New Hampshire Grants. And he said the New Hampshire Grants a country unpeopled, which we still are, there's only 600,000 of us, now abounds with the most rebellious race of the continent and hangs like a gathering storm on my left. Well, we're still that way. <laughs> and so we dug our feet in and we said, we are not giving up our sheep because there's absolutely nothing wrong with our sheep. And this is political, this is not, scientific. So by this point the kids are teenagers. Francis, huge James Bond fan, comes to me and he says, Mom, we're being watched. <laughs> I'm like, come on Francis. I said, I know this is stressful, but don't get paranoid on me. He's like, no, no, I know, I know we're being watched. And I said, how, how can you tell that? And he says, well, I see these guys going by and they have ties. And realize what I'm wearing, this, this, this is really dressed up for a Vermonter. <laughs> and he, he said, their cars are clean. And 80% of our roads are dirt, so nobody bothers to clean their cars. So we started noticing things customers coming into the store started noticing things and people were realizing that yes we were being watched and so we're friends with the local radio station owner and he said look he said get me a license plate number and so we got the license plate number he put it on the radio it was it the headline news at 12 o'clock because nothing happens in Vermont and he said Gold Mitsubishi license plate number such and such was seen at the Flace Farm. And why are they harassing them? Within 20 minutes, USDA called our lawyer. They said, that's not us. It's not the USDA, it's the Office of the Inspector General. So they admitted that we were being watched. So it ended up being a really stressful period because you have teenagers but they're being forced to grow up very quickly. Heather here, she was in charge of the media. And so she would have a clipboard, the day would be broken up into 15 minute segments and then she would tell each of us, okay, you're gonna do this interview now, dad, you're gonna do this interview. And she handled all the media. Francis ended up handling the store and the USDA and then Jackie would hide out in the cheese facility. So we took USDA to court to try to stop them from seizing the sheep. But unfortunately, 17 days before our appeals court hearing at 5.30 in the morning, in the middle of a, a snowstorm that was enough to close the schools in Vermont, they showed up. They had 42 armed federal agents and USDA officials. They took all the sheep. They took the lambs. They, they took everything that we had. The community was incredible. If you called the local school, the notice was there's no school today. Rumor is the seizures happening show up at the Felice Farm. So by six o'clock in the morning, we had over 70 people 
trying to block the road to stop the truck. They loaded all the sheep onto these open livestock trailers. So really, if you thought these animals might be contaminated, are you going to put them on an open livestock trailer, drive them all the way to Iowa? They took them to Iowa, and within a week, they killed all of them. Then the media started. And so, of course, everyone's hearing what's happening in Europe about mad cow disease. Everyone's thinking, oh, these sheep have mad cow. Unbeknownst to us, this was exactly what USDA wanted. They wanted all this publicity. So it was all across the United States and around the world. We've, we have newspapers from Japan and um, from all over Europe. So at this point, I was no longer my happy self. I was depressed. And I was, um, it literally was months of being really hard to deal. And so Larry, sorry, you would think this would get easier, doesn't it? Um, Larry, who, he's amazing, and he always stays calm. He's like, you should write a book. And I snarled at him, and I was like, what, what is writing a book going to do except for reliving everything over? And he said, well, people always talk about a book being healing. And I continued to just be challenging, let's put it that way. <laughs> well, we continued taking USDA to court, and we fought, we, through the court documents, we got copies of the records and found out that they had spent over a million dollars just in the monitoring of our farm and another farm up in northern Vermont that we had imported sheep from. So here's just one of the pages of the people that were assigned. Now you have to realize, like I said, we're a small state. The two guys that were responsible for watching us stayed, as you can see on here, at the Laguin up in Mount Pillar, and at night they would go into the bar and they would talk about what they did during the day. Well, the bartender was best friends with our lawyer's wife, and so she, she would hear all this. This is one of the pages of diaries from these, we called them the goons. And they did everything to tapping the phones, to surveillance, to having um, gliders going over, taking photos of the farm. Okay. So realize they, they, they took the sheep on March 23rd, 2001, and they had a week, they had them all killed within a week. It only takes three days to test for mad cow disease. Even if you're gonna do the most elaborate test, it's a three-day test. Most of the tests you can know within about eight hours. Months went by and we had no response from USDA. And so in August, USDA shows up at our farm again and said this, this time they're putting the entire farm under a quarantine and no test results. And so for five years, we could not have any ruminants. This was totally vindictive so that we would not be able to continue in business. They made us dismantle the barn. They destroyed Heather's milking parlor. They destroyed anything that came in contact with the sheep. Well, at that point, the depression stopped and then I got pissed off. <laughs> and so we sat down with our children and back then, it was called holistic resource management. Um, and we would do that with the children. And so, so we sat down again and we said, okay, these are all our assets. These are all the things that we can do. What do you guys want to do? So Francis wanted to finish all the construction projects, all the things that had been back burner during the fight. Heather wanted to get the farmer's market going. Jackie wanted to get the cheese classes going. And so we started, oh, and Larry and I wanted to do more cheese classes and then we also wanted to do consulting because we thought, well, if we can't farm, we're gonna help other people farm. And so we started teaching 
cheese and different culinary classes. This is a lacto-fermentation class. And then I started speaking out. So I spoke out to the, this is in the New York State Senate, and then to the Vermont Senate. Just, I wanted people to know what happened because I didn't want it to happen to anyone else. I wrote the book. The book did really well. I got a great publisher, Chelsea Green. We started doing cheese class, more and more cheese classes. Excuse me. And we had people coming from all around the world. And in the beginning, a lot of it was just curiosity about those people with the sheep. But then we started getting a, a good reputation for the cheese making. So we were invited to the Cheese School of San Francisco. We were invited down to teach in Washington, D.C. to do some consulting down in Texas. We got invited to Bermuda. That was really nice because it was in April, which is our mud season. <laughs> so we got to teach down there. And then we, we realized that we wanted to do more than just teaching. We wanted to help people be really successful with what they were doing. And so we d started doing business planning with people. And this is our friend Marco, who literally is one of the world's best gelato makers. And he wanted to learn cheese making. So he taught us gelato, and we taught him cheese making. And then we were impressed with the resiliency of other people. So. In California, as some of you may know, the regulations can be very expensive. If you're going to have a milk handler's license, you pay 750, $750 inspections, $750. In Vermont, $65 covers everything. So cheesemakers were renting a facility, making their cheese, putting it in their car like this, and they were pressing it. And then this Alyssa, she was taking it back to Berkeley and then aging it in this cool little cellar that she made. And so we started seeing all forms of resilience. In Mississippi, there was a woman that took our class because she had a generational dairy and she didn't want, the price of milk was so low, she wanted to figure out a way to save it. And so we worked with them on making cheese and now she and her husband have a thriving cheese business. Then Farmageddon came out. So Farmageddon is a documentary that we're in, and it's about us and seven other different farms that were basically attacked by the government for not a good reason. There was a showing of it on Capitol Hill, and Kristen Canty, the producer, and I went down, and she asked if I would do some of the interviews. I was interviewed by an Iowa radio station, and while I was being interviewed, a man called into the show and he said, oh, you know that woman that was just on about the sheep? He said, I was in charge of those sheep at USDA when they came and there was nothing wrong with those sheep. And the DJ said, are you saying this was a fraud? And he said, absolutely. He said, USDA used those sheep to get $450 million in funding from Congress and we ended up getting the documents to prove it. And the whole thing was to create a hysteria that was not focused on the beef industry, but was enough to get Congress excited about the fact that they should get their lab facilities upgraded. So at that point, we're like, okay, what we need to do is really help others be successful. So we extended the things that we were doing. We started working, this was a water buffalo farm in Northern California. Worked with them on making all different cheeses. Introduced them to our farm, our, to our friend Marco. And now they make gelato that they only sell to Thomas Keller and his restaurants. Dave down here in Texas, he calls himself a recovering lawyer. His passion is cheese and um, pizza, or flatbread, he calls it. And so he set up a very successful cheese-making business, Eagle Mountain. And then he purchased this building that's in a town that really needed to be revitalized, and he set up the Texas Flatbread House. And now he has a 
successful cheese business and pizza. So we were seeing that more and more people were pursuing the passion and ways that we could help them. So we had a student that came from Belize and he owns a resort down in Belize. Um, he's actually originally from Canada. And so he came to Vermont, made all these different cheeses, went back and then invited us down to Belize to his resort to do consulting for him. He put us up in the nicest jungle tree house that you can imagine. So that night we're laying in bed, surrounded by luxurious um, surroundings and Larry's laying there and he goes, ah, the power of cheese. <laughs> And, and so Ian also took off with his cheese making. So he had us come down multiple times for teaching. And then this one time we come down and he said, look, he said, I want to open a cheese shop in the capital. We went and looked at different locations. And then he's, I said, OK, well, let's go get a coffee and talk about it. And he's like, well, we don't have a cafe. And I said, you don't have a cafe in the capital? I said, screw a cheese shop. You should have a cafe, because that's what I was leaning toward. And, and he said, well, if we're going to have a cafe, we're going to have a deli, because he's obsessed with Katz's Deli. So that led to us moving to Belize for five months. We took our dogs with us. And I got to design two different delis. And um, we, we had an incredible time and we, we, the Belizean people are amazing to work with and so we got to train the staff. While we were in Belize we got a phone call from the cheese school of San Francisco and they said would you be willing to go to Colombia and South America and I knew nothing about Colombia except you know all the horror movies you see and so I look it up on the website. They said it was safe. Ended up going down and working with La Ratonera. It was an up and coming cheese company. And so we worked to redesign what they were making. And then we gave new recipes to them. And they called us last year all excited because they had entered the cheese in the world cheese competition in Spain. And they came in first place with our recipe. Thank you all. So, what happened with the kids? Well, Jackie, <laughs> she wanted to go to Middlebury. So, she, both she and her sister went to Middlebury, um, and she got a job at Lake Champlain Chocolates. So, she got to follow her passion. She married her high school sweetheart. They have these two adorable boys who can have all the chocolate they've ever wanted. <laughs> And then Heather, she met her soulmate. And they started a business together. And I call her New England's tiniest, cutest stonemason because they do tiling and dry stone walls. And then they gave birth to this magical being, which if you think I'm an optimist, she blows me out of the water. <laughs> and. Heather is very good at manifesting, and so Heather decided, she, she and Erin had already gotten together, had their daughter, then they decided they should get married. I think she took notes from me. <laughs> and so she manifested an all-expenses-paid trip to Dubai and Bali for their honeymoon. It was a sweepstakes she won. And then they get all the ice cream and chocolate drinks you could imagine from Lake Champlain. And then Francis, Francis is very good at making things happen. So he actually put a team together that he called Live the Dream. And he took six guys down six weeks to Chile for a photo shoot with extreme skiing, because that's Francis's passion. Started a very successful construction business, met a beautiful wife, but just to be on the safe side, he made sure he married a lawyer. And they just had this little cutie. So I just ask that you follow your passions and dream big. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. All right. Oh, that's almost on.
All right. Um, Carnell is going to help me do some Q&A. Um, so are there any questions? Oh, you got it. Yeah. Hi, I think all of us are just dying to know what the status of the USDA case is. So is the, sta over? the status of our case? Yeah, so, so everything, we, we took them to court to prove that what they did was wrong and they admitted that what they, they did was wrong, but there was no way that we could take it any further after that. And to this day, you cannot import sheep from Europe, but you can import cattle. Other questions? I see one up there. You got that one, Karno? Oh, yeah. Okay. Exercise. <laughs> it's an exercise. Yeah. Hi, thank you. That was absolutely amazing and inspiring. Thank you. I'm so sorry that that happened. Have you ever, I guess after losing your beloved sheep, have you ever thought about having more sheep? We, we did, but there were, not only did they take the sheep, they took the semen. And so there was no way to do what we wanted to do. And yet sheep had come from Europe over into Canada and down into the United States. And we asked USDA when they were going after us, we said, why, why aren't you going after them? And they said, well, give us their names and we will. So of course then we went quiet. Um, so there was no way to, to redo what we did, and by the time the five-year quarantine was up, all of our labor was gone. They were off in college. <laughs> yeah. Have you thought about, like, other sheep, maybe like Doifers or Winsledales or some other milking sheep? No. I, I, we, we, we loved what we had, and I, I don't think we could go, go back. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a more whimsical question. Just wondering what your fa personal favorite type of cheese is. Oh, good question. I, I like any really well-made cheese, but if I'm really pressed, I'll go for a Gruyere, but it has to be aged with the tyrosine crystals. Perfect, thank you so much. <laughs> Where do you go to, um, I mean, where are you now teaching cheese making? Um, well, I actually leave early tomorrow and then we're gonna be teaching in Pennsylvania. So May to October, we're mostly in Vermont, but then October to um, May, we're around the country and around the world. So we get to go to Florida in January and yeah. What's that? How long is the cheese making? So there's some cheeses like ricotta that you can make in 45 minutes. And then other cheeses, if you want to age, you might age a couple of years. And, and so the process, a three days gives you like an overview of the cheese making, but each cheese is different. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, regarding the, the FSMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act that that's been enacted and whenever it comes for, for me, I, I intend not to comply. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you have in dealing with you know, heavy handed uh, bureaucrats that come after you? Don't be quiet to, to speak up. Make, make sure you have as much local support as you can, but definitely don't be quiet because that, that is a tactic that they use to try to go after. So they, they've gone after some cattle farms and they threatened them into being quiet. So people that had imported cattle from Britain ended up having the cattle killed even though there was nothing wrong with them. But you never got to hear about them because USDA told them to be quiet and they did. You know, we stayed quiet for a year and then because it, the FOIA with it, 2020, it got in the media and that was a good thing. So we always, if we could do anything different, we would have been noisy at the beginning. But get, get local support. 
you know, we went to Bernie Sanders. He was a senator at the time for Vermont. And um, we said, look, you know, can you back us up? And he said, this thing is bigger than you know. If you're smart, you'll take whatever they offer you and run. Thank you for sharing. Um, I actually heard your story on a podcast a while ago, and I'm so grateful to actually meet you in person. Uh, I have you. a two-part question. Um, I just recently moved to New Hampshire with an interest in starting a raw sheep dairy. Nice. Um, and that's kind of how I found your story. But there are other East Frisian dairies that have mm -hmm. been in the US. Were those sheep mostly imported from Canada? And then the other part of my question is, um, there's this growing movement of goat dairy that hasn't been troubled with, you know, but the sheep dairy still remains a very low scale, not as popular option, which has always surprised me. And so I'm, is this why? It, it, it could be part of it, you know, because it, it terrified people that were trying to do sheep dairying at the time. And it really impacted them, especially when all the media came out and then people started associating, associating sheep with possible um, mad cow disease. So um, I would definitely recommend doing the, the sheep or goat dairy in New Hampshire. You know, the market in New England's phenomenal. But, yeah. The motivation was to get the funding from Congress because they had repeatedly gone to Congress to try to upgrade the lab, and Congress wasn't interested because this was a lab that handled animal diseases. And so if you had a disease of animals that could potentially affect humans, then congressmen and congresswomen are gonna pay a lot more attention. And so that, and they thought we would go away quietly. There's a... I'm coming. So I am curious about the resiliency of your family because that was really striking to me and you sharing your story, even in your family dynamics from the very beginning of the story and hearing about how you really chose a collaborative approach to parenting as opposed to authoritarian. And like, what led you to that? And also, like, I'd just say, like, holy cow, that's really cool. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if you could speak on that, I, like, I think, uh, like, we create change from coming from, like, healthy families. So right. that, I think, is really a cool part right. of the story. But, but if you could write down that part about us not being authoritative and <laughs> give it to our kids. <laughs> no, because because we had done the holistic management, and, and we made sure that each of the children were focusing on their passions, there were times that we had to step aside and let them make the decisions. And I think that that really helped. It, it made it 10 times more painful for the kids when they went through everything. And, um, you know, I was a person who grew up, grew up believing in the government, believing that you know, things were based on science, that it wasn't political. And now I have, you know, Francis started Amnesty International at his high school, and then he went to Harvard and studied at the Center for Human Rights because they're so passionate about human rights. And so it was trying to find a balance between, you know, letting them have things that they did and giving them responsibility and you know, there were many times when their, their peers were just going home and watching TV and they're working till nine o'clock at night. You know, so I, there were times that they resented us for that, <laughs> you know, but now we've gotten incredible compliments from them because they all have really good work ethic. Yeah. Well, thank you for all those. Did good you have? <laughs> Okay, great. So your question got answered naturally. Okay. Um, that's all the time we have.
for questions, but I would like to ask Linda if you have any final words you want to share as we wrap up here. Follow your passion. You know, see what it is that you really want to do. And if you're doing something in your life and it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Life is too short to not be doing what we love. Woo. <laughs> Thank you. What a beautiful note to end on.